exceptional conversation uh, that we're about to have. And uh, just in case, I, I'm, I'm not sure what uh, was sent out, but let me just introduce myself. My name is Jordan McKay, and I have been a wine writer, a journalist, and an author of books for the last 20-something years. Um, and last year, uh, Decanter Magazine asked me, they, they tasked me with the, uh, with the um, objective of writing an article about the most, who, the most influential winemakers in North America. And uh, they tasked some other wine writers to do that in other countries. And so I was, I was doing the U.S., and part of that, they wanted, I got to select the people. They didn't tell me who to pick. And, and that's a big responsibility. Plus, they also wanted, um, they wanted as much geographic diversity as possible. And so I really, I thought about it long and hard. And, and, and also, they kind of wanted some degree of, of you know, current significance and not just historical, you know, um, Robert Mondavi, et cetera, et cetera. So anyway, I took all of these, um, um, I, I took all of these uh, ideas and I, I got back to the editors at Decanter and I said, well, sorry, you know, uh, as much as I'd love to, we can't have complete geographic diversity. Dr. Constantine Frank in the Finger Lakes is not quite, he's important, but not super, uh, maybe not so influential in the rest of the country. And I was like, there's a lot of great winemaking history in Washington state, but I couldn't think of anyone who necessarily impacted the industry in the way that, uh, that the two people that we have here, but that we're here to listen to today um, did and the others I selected. So um, so with that, I'll just say that, that um, I, I really thought instantly of, of Ken and of Kathy. And so I know some of you are here from Kathy's uh, wine subscription and some are here from Ken's. And so it's a great way to introduce you to these other very, very important winemakers. And um, if I'll just, and I'll turn this over in just a second, I'll just summarize why, uh, you know, kind of why I picked them and, um, you know, and, and, from each camp, you'll you'll be aware of this, but th there's no question that Kathy, you have become uh, one of the most relevant winemakers in California, and it's interesting. You've been doing what you've been doing for a long time, but your your relevance only seems to to grow as um, as America's wine palate and wine generations grow up. And and it's uh, I, I think as I said in the piece, it was by resolutely being yourself and never following trends and making incredible wines to your own taste, whether they were fashionable, whether they got great scores or moderate scores or whatever, and, and just being an exemplar of, I think, what we think wine, um, wine should be in a, in a place that tends to blow a little bit with the direction of the wind, you know? And, um, and of course, I've had so many of your wines and love them and, and they age, uh, all the things that we care about. Anyway, so, and, and we'll let you elaborate on all that. And then Ken, I mean, I also have had some great interactions with you over the years. And one of my, one of my strongest memories was sitting, I don't know whether it was Oregon Pinot Camp or somewhere or journalists were, and was you standing at your chalkboard giving us one of the first like really, really hardcore lectures on soil and um, and soil. Now it's so commonplace to hear everyone try to associate soil type with flavors and wines, with textures, with things like that. But you were doing that well before um, everyone was hiring geologists to come and map their their lands. And and that just fed out of what you were already doing and and really trailblazing, making single vineyard wines and prioritizing the expression of individual sites with your Pinot Noir. So uh, th those are two huge, huge things. Um, and then of course, and in, in with Kathy uh, being balanced, balanced Cabernet, you know, was uh, it, California Napa forgot about that or a lot of people did for a long time. And, and you have definitely uh, galvanized a whole new generation of wine drinkers with with your wine. So anyway, 
with that, I think it would be really fun to hear from our vintners. <laughs> That's why we're here. Um, and I would love for you guys just to tell a little bit your story, you, uh, you know, your background and how you came to be doing what you're doing and to make it to this exalted status. Why don't we start with you, Kathy? Okay, um, I've been making wine all my adult life. I was minding my own business, studying biology at Pomona College. I was 19 years old. I don't think they would let me take this class today. I, and on a complete whim, I took a wine appreciation class from John Hager, interestingly enough. He's still oh, wow. a pretty important um, writer of uh, books around Pinot Noir and Riesling. Um, but anyway, that was a very long time ago. Wine grabbed me by the neck and ran with me. For all the usual reasons, it was delicious. It made food taste better. You shared it with friends. But for me as a biologist, lay layered in on top of that was the fact that um, wine is a whole series of living systems that collaborate in the alchemy. We, re we really don't understand it very well, but they collaborate and uh, in the magic of wine. And so this just grabbed me by the neck and ran with me. Two years later, I graduated, and two days later, I was in the Napa Valley. And back in those days, there weren't all the regions we've come to know, but Oregon was just getting started, and many of the regions in California hadn't happened at all. So it was Sonoma or Napa, and there was a little bit more um, of a critical mass, I think, um, starting in the mid-60s, starting to really um, work hard on making world-class wines. And so it was the, the obvious place to, to be. I went over to Davis for a brief detour and got my master's degree in winemaking and been making wine ever since here in the Valley. First for, for decades for other people. And then now it's been, I just put my 35th vintage for Corison in the wow. in bar. I don't know how that happened. <laughs> Did you ever, ever entertain thoughts of, of going to another place besides Napa or they're just, as you were saying, there, there weren't so many other choices. We weren't as mobile as kids are today. I mean, today, if you're, if you're studying wine, winemaking, you get out of school and you hop between hemispheres. So in four years, in four, in two years, you can get four vintages under your belt we really didn't do much of that in those days. So no, it was really, you know, where can I go and make a living? Mm -hmm. And, um, and at Pomona college, what, why did you decide to take John Hager's wine course? Did you have, was your family a wine drinking family? It, no, my father drank Gallo Hardy Burgundy oh. <laughs> and until he died, he wouldn't spend more than $8 for a bottle of wine. Um, but so the question what say again the question oh uh, yeah why did you decide to take john hager's class it, it changed I can't your make, life i cannot make this story up i was a springboard diver and a gymnast through high school and then when i got to college there was no women's diving team so i dove on the men's team and i have a, <laughs> a little i have a little letter jacket to prove it i think they had to buy a children's size <laughs> and so um Anyway, um, oh, that, so what, yeah. what does that have to do with wine? Um, as an adjunct to that, I, I um, did a lot of trampoline all my life. And so there was this program where students and professors taught things that were extracurricular. And I taught a trampoline class. And John and I were at the sign up and our tables were right next to each other before anybody came in. And on a complete whim, I put my name at the top of that list. I had heard about the class. I would have loved to take it, but I didn't think there's probably any way I could get in. And that's the rest is history. Well, that is an amazing twist of fate. And also now I realize that I can use the adjective bouncy to, uh, to describe you. Um, <laughs> So, uh, okay, Formerly. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll turn to Ken now, Ken. Uh, and so what's interesting is that your story, I mean, uh, you, were, you were having your revelations and things like that at a very similar time frame as, uh, as Kathy, right? So how did you come to, and, and we're talking here in the, um, what is it, the late 70s then? 
Oh. Actually, the the genesis for getting into wine happened in 1974 and five when I was in Lexington, Kentucky, which we all know is the home of all fine wine, and uh, <laughs> actually bourbon, basketball, and horses. Yeah, mm -hmm. but uh, I was working at a restaurant to put myself to school at UK University of Kentucky, and it was my first opportunity to try really outstanding wines. It was a terrific restaurant, fantastic wine list. The owner became upset though with the staff because most of us in the front of house were college students, didn't know, you know, couldn't afford good wine, didn't know much about it. He, uh, and, and so he, at one point we had a meeting and he got, he got incensed that we weren't selling his wine, but we all said, we really don't know what to say. We've never had these wines. And good on him, his name was Stan Pekarski, I'll never forget him. He, he said, fair enough, we are going to, in all of our staff meetings going forward, we're going to choose a region and we're gonna taste every bottle from that region until we get through the whole list. Mm -hmm. And it took us about four or five months. Wow. But we were tasting amazing wines. And I mean, it's, this is a, you know, like Lytton Springs from Ridge and um, mm -hmm. we had, First growth Bordeaux and Romani Conti, um, you know, we had amazing, I mean, it was stupid, right? It's just amazing wines uh, from all over the planet, tremendous German Rieslings and more. And we, I fell in love with it. I had no idea wine could be that good. And, um, and so I, I ended up reading everything I could about wine at the time and um, ended up, uh, also had a friend who was a horticulturalist, was my roommate. Um, we planted a vineyard for the university, uh, he did, uh, that was a miserable failure. Uh, there tough, in uh, tough terroir out there. <laughs> the humidity is yeah. unbelievable and the diseases that come with it are, are awful. So mm. we ended up, he and I both, he actually came to Oregon first, went to Oregon State to get his doctorate. And, uh, and I went to California and uh, after taking classes at UC Davis, I ended up getting into the business in Monterey County in uh, 78 and was making wine for, at that time, Shalone and Ventana. And uh, we, I was at, I was, my home base was Ventana, but we were making the Gavlin wines for Shalone in that facility. Mm -hmm. And that was a, it was a remarkably lucky thing for me as a young uh, person who knew nothing uh, to, to be in that environment. Uh, Dick Graff, who really created Shalone, uh, also created a research group um, that I was lucky enough to be invited to because I was part of their world. And because I knew the least among everyone, they made me take all the meeting minutes and be the secretary. So, uh, and this group included people that Kathy knows well. Uh, you know, it was uh, Stephen Kistler, um, Rick Foreman, uh, got Josh Jensen and Steve Dorner wow. from Calera, Richard Sanford and Bruno D'Alfonso from Sanford. Uh, of course, the folks that we met at Mount Eden is where we met every month. We would meet at Mount Eden, said you know, Jeffrey and Ellie. Uh, it was a fantastic group. And we would have, um, we had two Burgundy producers who were mimicking some of our research work. And that was Jacques Sess at Domaine du Jacques and Aubert Vallon at the Domaine de la Romani Conti. And so, because I was the secretary, and this was the year, Kathy, I think it was 78 that the fax was actually became real. And so I would take the meeting minutes and send them by fax to Jacques and Aubert. And that's how we communicated uh, our results of our work. Um, but it was, you know, for me, as a young person to be in that environment was just amazing. So I kept my mouth shut and my ears open and, and learned a great deal. Uh, well, eventually, yeah. uh, you know, my friend, my friend from Oregon, ended up becoming the vineyard manager for what was then called Canutes and Erath. He's also the same gentleman who planted Domaine Druin and managed that for years. Stoller, Argyle, all their properties. So he's a he's a figure in the world of viticulture here. Um, and we, during that time I was in California, we traveled to to see each other quite often. I I was up here in Oregon quite a bit fell in love with the Pinot Noir up here, just fell in love with it, wanted eventually to be here, but really couldn't afford to uh, until 1986. 
And in 86, I had a couple nickels that I could put together uh, and came up and started my own. Wow. Well, and um, there's things I want to circle back on, on all of that story. I mean, it, it's amazing just to, because both of you, uh, you know, just following your heart and getting in, uh, being a pioneer has its benefits because you become associated with so many other incredible uh, foundational people in your, the industry. Um, I totally neglected to uh, follow our carefully rehearsed run of show, by the way. <laughs> um, so I apologize for that. But we were going to start off by um, by uh, offering the audience, uh, everyone out there, if you uh, if you have the wines that were meant to accompany this we were going to actually invite you to open them if you haven't already. You probably have. I'm sure you don't need uh, you don't need a prompting for that. But um, but we were just going to briefly discuss them. Yes, and um, and so uh, so we can enjoy them before we get on with the uh, with the storytelling. So Ken, since you're uh, since you're on my screen right now, um, why don't you tell us a, a little bit about the wine uh, that that you're pouring and what its significance it uh, is to you, yeah. So we're, we're pouring the Savoia 2019 Pinot Noir. It's a specific site. It is the, actually it's the first property we purchased. For many years, we simply leased property or did acreage contracts here in the region. Um, but, but we needed a lot of experience to understand what the qualities were of all the different regions. And they're, and they're quite different uh, in, in this area. And so we spent our first 12 years really sourcing so, a lot of different sites to get to know the area very well. And it, it took 12 years for us to be certain that we would make a good choice on buying property. And that's when we began buying property is 1998. And that's when we bought Savoia. That was the mm -hmm. first property. Uh, which is in the Yamhill Carlton viticultural area. It's where I live now with my my lovely wife and my two girls, and uh, we. Uh, it's a it's oh a at Savoia. Yes. Mm. Yeah, and so it's a uh, um, it's a it's a it's a gorgeous southeast uh, slope in the, in the Yamhill Carlton area, which is a ridge line of old marine. It's old ocean bed, old marine sediments, just old sand, and. Mm. Uh, and so that's that's the that's that's where this site is from. So it's our first owned property. Uh, we've had, we've bought more since, but um, for me, it, it, there's a for me it's a it, it's and obviously I lived there as well, and so there's a, a strong attachment to the site. Great, and um, and then is this? Uh, would you say that uh, this is a typical expression of Savoia? This uh, vintage that you're pouring. The marine sediments in our area, when you plant in sand, once you get past soil um, and the roots are engaging parent material, and then in this case, it's going to be sand. That's very old, it's 45, 50 million years old or so. Uh, and it's sandstone or siltstone in our region. Once you begin to engage it, you begin to see with the uptake of all these trace elements that are in that mother rock, you begin to see detail and complexity. In the sandy areas of our world, Pinot Noir tends to be very savory. It's um, rather than being fruit directed, which the, the volcanic areas tend to be very fruit focused and very laser like, but the marine sediments tend to be quite different, very different, and they tend to be savory. You get to see chocolate, anise, clove, uh, cinnamon, uh, you know, leather, mm -hmm. uh, many mushrooms, a lot of qualities that are not fruit driven. Is, this, is a, this is a typical profile. And I also think of them, uh, wine, uh, peanuts that I've had uh, that, that are in a lot of sand to, to be, um, as you almost uh, would expect, like sort of textural, texturally silky. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's in texture. I think that's what for me, I mean, Kathy has her love, and you know, it's it, it's awesome to to see what she's doing, and and my love is Pinot Noir. I, for me, it's the varietal I am absolutely most attracted to, and part of that, as you said, is texture. Mm -hmm. I think when Pinot Noir is, when it's amazing, when the texture, when it's properly 
when you're farming correctly and you're getting all this expression and you take, you're an incredible steward in, in the cellar, it's on the, the textures you can achieve are just, it's just amazing. It's, and it's, 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 as you said, silky, just, just this, this lush quality that I find incredibly attractive. Yeah, and um, I no, I agree. And and uh, and before uh, before I ask uh, ask for uh, Kathy's uh, to her to describe her her wine, um, I also wanted to mention to the audience. Um, uh, hopefully, this all this discussion and these wines will inspire uh, you to think of some questions that you want to put to uh, to our winemakers here. So please uh, feel free to enter your questions, and I will I I will be fed them um, on. Uh, cue cards, virtual cue cards, and um, and <clears throat> um, we'll ask them. And by the way, feel free to ask anything, um, whether it's it's about history, uh, philosophy, thoughts, technical things. We can get as geeky as anyone wants here. We've got two of the great wine minds in the US. So, uh, so don't hesitate to ask anything you want. Um, now, Kathy, I happen to know something of your drinking uh, habits, and I know you're very that you, you love Pinot Noir as well, and you also are very adventurous and you love to taste widely. And, and frankly, uh, as Ken was saying, I know texture is also something really, really important to you in your wines. So tell us a little bit about, about what you uh, have offered today. So this is the 2018 Chorus in Napa Valley Cabernet Sauvignon. It's the, it's the wine I, I established the label with 35 years ago, sourcing um, Cabernet on the what we call the Rutherford bench between Rutherford and St. Helena and that's just our jargon for the alluvial fans coming out of the hills and the soils are are gravelly loam they hold moisture when the vines need it in the spring and into the early summer but we have rainless summers it's very unusual in the world really and the vines run out of water most years right around the first of August which is when when veraison happens, the grapes go from green and hard and photosynthesizing like a leaf. It's like a, a switch is turned and they turn soft and black and accumulating sugar and color and flavor and losing acidity. So for me, this, this wine was in my head. For other people, I made wine in the hills from some of the best Cabernet vineyards in the world, but this wine inside of me needed to be both powerful and elegant. Cabernet is gonna be powerful, it doesn't matter what you do, but for me, it's much more interesting at the intersection of elegance. And that's what I've been chasing all my life. And here on the bench, uh, we've learned a lot about canopy management. We're able to um, ripen these grapes, if we're careful, at lower sugars than most people, do and keep the alcohols under 14%. I want them to be powerful and elegant. I want them to grace the table. I want them to speak of where they grew and I want them to have a long, interesting life. And that's, I had to go to the Rutherford bench for that. Mm. Yeah, and you know, um, it's it's all those qualities that you, that you mentioned, I'm sure Ken would eagerly second and I do too. And um, it is interesting um, to get a little bit back into your career, you know, um, as I as I sort of said up top, you know, we've seen um, we've seen Napa go through many phases where lots of people did not pursue elegance. They did not pursue sight expression, you know, um, kind of the opposite. And, um, you know, where did you develop your taste for those things? And and how did you know, like that it was always the. Uh, the right thing to do to pursue that? Well, I think it's tasting the wines of the world. And I've always been, uh, I just love wine and I love the wines of the world. And my favorite wines all over the world have a life force, a, a vibration. Uh, and it has to do with balance. It has to do with acidity, but you can't take a, an overripe wine or grapes and then add acid back and get that life force back. Um, so that's a fundamental concept for me. I also know that the Napa Valley had been making world-class Cabernet Sauvignon since the late 19th century. It was, it was winning expositions in Europe for Cabernet-based wines way, way back. And then first half of the 20th century wiped everything out with two world wars, a, a, a depression, and not to mention prohibition. So it really wasn't until 
the 60s that everything started to wake up again. So, uh, but there's a, there, there were wineries that had been making wine since the 30s and 40s, making beautiful Cabernet based wines and Beaulieu, Krug, um, Martini. And there were still wines around from those times. So um, it's just, it's, I'm also feel like I, I need to make the wine I like. That's why I went to this place to get the grapes. But mm -hmm. now it's my job to let these soils speak. And this right. is just, I'm interpreting it the way I hope is the best way or the best way for me. Mm -hmm. So many, um, so many Cabernets seem to put kind of varietal expression mm -hmm. first. Um, do you remain as fascinated by Cabernet Sauvignon as, um, as when you started? Um, I mean, it's, it's interesting because both of you sort of focus on, you know, heavily on one variety and I, and you've a whole career. It's, it's interesting. Well, these are two of the top varieties in the world. I mean, they're truly, yeah. they're the kings of, of Vitus vinifera. Um, so absolutely. I, I don't make Cabernet because I think it's better than any other varieties. I make Cabernet because I'm in the Napa Valley. What yeah. else would I do? Right. Um, that said, it's infinitely interesting. And I learn something new every day. Um, Stylistically, I'm trying to do exactly the same thing I start out doing. I hope this many years later, I'm better at it. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, there's something to be said for, for honing one's craft through mindful repetition. It seems very almost uh, Buddhist, you know, um, um, to go through that practice. Ken, um, you, uh, you chose Pinot Noir, but obviously mm -hmm. in, your, in your research group, you uh, you were uh, surrounded by other people who made other grapes as well, and um, you know, or a place like Mount Eden where they do both, you know, and and sort of and do both so well that it it kind of um, undercuts the idea that that you, they can't coexist. You know, it's interesting. Um, did you ever was Pinot Noir something that just grabbed you from the beginning, uh, or did you ever mess around with uh, or consider? moving to Napa or and doing something different? Well, when I was in uh, the Monterey County, there was, we did make a little bit of Pinot Noir, not a lot. It was mostly Chardonnay mm -hmm. uh, at that time. Um, but I, I think that my, my love of Pinot Noir really started actually back in Kentucky at that same restaurant. Oh. I, had a 19, I had a 1971 Volne Cayere from Bouchard that was mind bending and <laughs> <laughs> it was incredibly fantastic it had a persistence i'll never forget it I, because i actually became the wine buyer for the restaurant for a short while before i left for california and i remember at that time that wine from the distributor was selling for about six dollars and seventy cents and you know, it was just insane when you think about it. But um, and it was it was one of those wines that you, you would take you would take a sip of it, and it would persist in your mouth for minutes. It was insane. It was it's just a magical wine. The seventy one vintage for me, actually, is my favorite uh, from that from that region. But that wine hooked me deeply. It, it was. Uh, I was, I, I was cooked and I, I knew that someday that's what I wanted to do. Um, but I had not yet experienced Oregon. You know, mm -hmm. I, um, I was simply tasting wines from around the world, uh, but going to California and then visiting my friend in Oregon and having probably a half dozen, I had a half dozen or so experiences with wines from Oregon that were magical, mm -hmm. just magical. Well, there was a lot of, in the early days, because there was really um, no such thing as acreage agreements, everything, uh, there was no control of crop necessarily. And so in the cold years, Oregon would struggle in the, in the coldest years. It would struggle for ripeness because there was too much crop and you simply couldn't get it home in time mm -hmm. before the rains of the fall. But by doing acreage agreements, we started doing acreage agreements, which allowed us to control crop in 1987. Mm -hmm. And that was 
that was a critical point for the Oregon industry where we got, you know, we, we took charge, took charge of crop level so that even in a cold year, we could adjust crop level to ensure that we would be ripe, absolutely ripe before fall rain. That was critical. Um, that changed everything for us. It made the fruit obviously far more expensive because we were dropping crop, you know, half the crop at, in some years on the vineyard floor. You know, that was, and it was, it, and that was, that made it twice as expensive as it otherwise would have been. But as Kathy knows, in the end, you, you survive as a region based on your quality in the end, you know, and for a tiny, a tiny region like Oregon, which is underfunded, uh, our only chance to compete in the world stage of quality is to make incredibly beautiful wine. That's our only way of, of, of competing. And, and we can, and we do. And it's, and it's been, so along the way, that was one of the things that was critical. But I did have those experiences in, in Oregon um, in, in the very good years before I was here that convinced me this is where I wanted to be. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting. And, and yes, you, you mentioned that about, you know, turning to, to uh, acreage contracts uh, rather than. Right. 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 Whoa. Hello. Okay. <laughs> um, hi, Barry. Yeah. yeah. Um, oh, sorry. No. <laughs> um, the, uh, you mentioned and and that seems like it, we take that sort of idea for granted now, uh, Ken, but at the time it was a very novel idea. And also there's not really a precedent for it because, you know, both of you, the influential wines on both of that were from Europe, they don't have the same economy where of sort of growers and winemakers like like we do here. And so was that something, Ken, that idea of, of paying by the acre, was that something that was uh, kind of innovated in your uh, wine uh, research group there? Or was that something, you know, for you or Kathy, that, that was kind of generally in the conversation um, at, the, at the time? Well, for us, it was something that we, uh, having our first vintage was 1986. And with vineyards that were positioned in the valley that had enough heat, and ripened earlier, and those would be the, the marine sediments. Those, those vineyards that are in the marine sediments, because that's, you have a sandy profile, they drain very quickly. And as Kathy, Kathy was talking earlier about how that you have that transition you know, from the plant being green growing to ripening fruit. And, and that profile, if it's part of the influence of that, and I, I think she may, would agree, is the loss, that loss of moisture that she was mentioning. You lose that moisture and the plant goes, uh oh, I'm running out of water. And that, that transition begins. And if you're in a sandy profile, it happens sooner. It happens much sooner than in the clay based areas that we have, which hold moisture later. And so the sandy areas in our, in our world in 1986 ripened in plenty of time uh, to be beautifully, you know, very balanced. But the late sites, that were clay-based, which are volcanic. Those clay-based sites, they were rained on. And, and, and we had, you know, we struggled. We struggled with those sites. And when that happened, we all sat down and looked at each other, me, myself, and I. <laughs> and we, it was just me at the time. But we looked at each other and we said, you know, we need to do something about this. And so we went to our growers and said, we need a new way to do business. Can we Let's consider buying by the acre instead of by the ton. So that if we think we're gonna have a, a lot of crop or a cold year, we can hasten ripening by adjusting that crop level. Mm -hmm. um, and, the, and the growers were ecstatic because for the first time they, were, they knew how much money they were gonna make. You know, cause we said it was at that time it was 5,000 a ton or 5,000 an acre, forgive me, 5,000 an acre which was at that time a really good income, really good. And so we were guaranteeing them a very healthy income and they were over the, you know, over the moon about it. And, and so it, it, it did increase our cost of production a bit for sure, but in the end consistency came and consistency is everything. Yeah. 
Well, um, as a freelance writer, by the way, um, the idea of knowing how much I would be making up, it sounds really great um, to me uh, consistently. Um, Kathy, for you, um, you know, Cabernet obviously famously sets a uh, usually a, a bigger crop than than Pinot Noir. Um, is that something that you also have to mind? Are your crop levels to achieve the flavors you want or the wines you want to achieve? Absolutely. It's all about balance. Mm -hmm. so we're growing grapes. We're doing two things. We're balancing the way the vine grows and the way it fruits. And then we're managing the canopy to get the right amount of air and light into the fruit. And, that's mm -hmm. it. and we spend all summer doing it. It's so we, many, many passes through. Um, so it's, it's, when I first got here 47 years ago, grape growing was comprised of pruning and picking. The crops were quite a bit higher. It was still a lot of Cabernet, not nearly as much as now, but crops were much bigger and they had a lot harder time getting the grapes ripe. In fact, the, wine, the wineries would give bonuses to get them up to 24 bricks. Wow. Fast forward to today and you know, I, I want to pick buy 24 bricks in a perfect world and and never more than 25 but that's considered very very low sugar mm -hmm. here in napa now so very different um grape growing we've learned so much from research all over the world australia new zealand uc davis about canopy management and it's really it's really completely changed grape growing and I think most of the increase in quality we've seen in the last 20 years comes from understanding canopies. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah. and so I'm, 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 I'm looking for exactly the same things. I'm, I pick early on early gravel pit sites. And that's one of the reasons I can keep my alcohols so low. But the other reason is, is the, in, the extreme care we take in the vineyard managing the canopy. Mm -hmm. Well, um, oh, and by the way, we have some excellent questions rolling in now, and uh, I'll, I'll get to those in about five minutes, uh, because some of them, I think, will foster some uh, some good discussion. Um, to, to both of you, it, it's interesting, and Kathy, I don't know where you actually live, but I one time a, uh, a California winemaker who was setting out in the business told me about some advice, a great French uh, vigneron gave him, he, he said, you know, how do I, how do I ensure I make great uh, wine? And, um, and he said, build your house on your vineyard. And so you're seeing that every day. And Ken, I know you make many sites now, but you also mentioned earlier that you live at, uh, at this vineyard. And, and Kathy, I, like, I don't know if, whether you live at your vineyard, but your winery is right there. And so you do see those vines every day. Right. Yeah, I don't live at the vineyard. I live two miles away, but I'm in the vineyard every single day. Yeah, yeah, and um, um, and would you agree with that? That just sort of being there, I, that even no I mean, to those of us who just drive by, uh, you know, vineyards don't look that different. But when you're in them and you know them every day, you see things. Yes. Both in winemaking and grape growing, it's all in the details. Mm -hmm. All in the details. Yeah. And Ken, um, you're nodding your head. Uh, it, it's it's interesting because you're obviously a very famous guy, a vineyard person who has uh, prioritized vineyard expression over everyone. And now you make so many different single vineyards. Uh, I'm sure you have a great team. Is it still for you a, a huge priority to, to get in and, and see the vines and get your hands on them um, as, as often as possible? Absolutely. Yeah, we so for us it's um, you're right when you're when your feet are in the in the site and, and it, it's about it's about putting in I think the steps a, a lot of it actually and as, as an example when we get to close to harvest and I spend the entire year with the vineyard team going to different sites and talking looking at performance and trying to decide what what might be needed we do a lot of testing for you know, nutrition, trying to understand whether or not we have issues with, with nutrition or microbiology, what have you. But in, and in the end though, the, the most pivotal decision I make every year is when to pick, I think. And so I, I want that to be me 
not because I'm the most amazing person uh, for tasting, but I do have a lot of experience and, and, it, and I make, I think I make a consistent decision and I think that's good. And so I mm -hmm. like to be out there. I walk the vineyards and I take someone with, I take folks with me who will have refractometers. And so they're yelling out numbers while I'm tasting, but I just taste, I taste while I'm hearing, you know, people behind me talking about what they're seeing, but I'm tasting. And there's a point for me, there's a point where the fruit goes, you know, it starts off quite green, quite acidic, and then it develops, you know, develops sugar, it becomes quite sweet, but there is a point later where you get depth, you get, you'll be tasting the fruit and then there's, there's just, there's this depth that comes down to your gullet and, and you involuntarily, you're going, wow, like, wow, wow. And when that happens, when you're saying, wow, nine out of 10 times, you need to call the crew and be ready to go. <laughs> and, so, and so that's a call I want to make. I love making, but you got, you know, like, and Kathy knows this, it's, you have to be out there in the vineyard and, 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 and tasting uh, on a regular basis. And, and then, and then you'll know, it, you will know, you'll know when things are correct. Right. Yeah. Uh, it's definitely something that I've, I've learned and not having made wine myself, but, uh, but I don't think it can be overstated the importance of that moment of deciding when to pick. And Kathy, I'm going to, uh, so also for, uh, for all of you out the audience, if you have a, a few questions, I, I'm, you should uh, direct message chat the question, direct message chat questions to the, uh, to the um, Ken Wright and Corison in chat. So that's my instruction to pass on to you. Um, so uh, we're gonna get to actually a couple of questions, but but Kathy, in segue to that, cause there's a couple about your uh, specific wines. Um, what do you, I'm sure that you agree about the importance of picking time. Um, is that, is Ken's method similar to yours to, to get out and, and to taste? Absolutely, I've, I've never, for as long as I've made Chorus and Cabernet, I've done all the sampling and it's the most important decision I make. It, I can't make the wine any better than the grapes that come in the door. So we've worked all season to have it all be in balance. And then when it's time, it's time. And for me, I explain it, I describe it as almost an explosion in the mouth. There's a, there's a all of a sudden you're, you're watching the flavors evolve and then all of a sudden, it just sort of explodes in the mouth, the flavors, and mm. it's time to pick. It's interesting because, uh, because I always imagine it as being a very difficult decision to make, but both of you describe it as the sort of the, the grapes, and I guess this just comes through, through experience, uh, the grapes announce it to you. Um, um, but in a very palpable way. Uh, it's interesting, you both, I've never heard people describe it quite so, um, so you know, emphatically. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. So, um, yeah, Jordan, I think it shows, I think it shows in tasting Kathy's wines over all these years, that consistency and the, the wines are, I love her wines because they are har so harmonious, mm -hmm. so harmonious. And to me, Kathy, that is the greatest, the greatest thing about what, that's what wine should be. Um, great wine should be very harmonious, and and I and I think that I think that that has a lot to do with your shadow in the vineyard. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. No question. But you don't want to shade the vines too much with your shadow, Kathy. <laughs> <laughs> and, and frankly, we can't learn about a vineyard just making wine from it for one year. That's a snapshot. Mm -hmm. We, when we spend years making wine from the same vineyard, we get to know it in a way that's it's intangible, but it's very real. Yeah, and I, I totally agree. I think that's one of the secrets of great wine that uh, that sort of the American, you know, winemaker on the run, changing jobs every few years, winemaker for hire thing just does not suit uh, that level of attention and experience that, that is really required to, uh, to really find something. Um, okay, we're going to switch over to questions right now because they're starting to roll in and I want to get to as many as possible. And they're like, there are some that could have some long discussion. So, but first, uh, Kathy, um, uh, someone out there is uh, 
they would like for you to comment on the 2018, which is being poured versus the 2003, which is what they're happen to be drinking tonight, the 03. Interesting. Well, the 2018, I didn't say before, but it was a nearly perfect vintage for us. And what that means for me is that from Verasion around the 1st of August until we pick early in September, um, the longest, coolest season always makes the best wine for me. And in mm -hmm. 2018, there wasn't a single day over 100 degrees. And in fact, in August, there were days that plummeted into even the 70s. Anybody that knows Napa knows that's really, really cool. So longest, coolest seasons are always my favorite. This um, Mother Nature just handed that to us. So I, I love this wine. Um, the 03 was a lot like that. I would mm -hmm. say it was even longer and cooler. Um, so similar vintages. Interesting. Uh, yeah. It's always my favorite profile. It's it's interesting that these uh, that these people out there would be um, would have selected that, and I wonder if that was coincidental or if they had some sort of inkling of. Um, and then while we're with you, uh, someone else wanted to ask about the differences between your Cabernet, the Chronos, and the Sun Basket. Well, the Cabernet Sauvignon, the wine we're tasting today, I found in the I I didn't have vineyards, I didn't have a winery. I just knew where to get the grapes and I knew what to do with them. So it was all done with smoke and mirrors for a long, long time before we built a winery. And so um, these are great vineyards, great Cabernet vineyards between Rutherford and St. Helena that I don't own until recently. Now the current wines do have Sun Basket as an important part of the blend. Um, but we only had the good fortune to purchase that vineyard in 2015, mm -hmm. having sourced it for 30 years. Mm -hmm. So there came a time when Chorus and Winery was mature, it was making when it sold and we were debt free. And I was hopeful that we could buy a little bit of Rutherford Bench Cabernet. And my husband went out looking and had the great we had the great good fortune to be able to purchase what is now Kronos Vineyard, where the winery is. So that was our second Cabernet. It's a single vineyard, a state single vineyard wine. Um, it, it all grows here. And then, as I mentioned a few years ago, we, we had the amazing fortune to buy one of my very favorite vineyards, and we named it the Sun Basket Vineyard, having its a stone's throw away from Kronos. Um, so those wines are, it's a different concept. Um, blending is a powerful thing, even though these are 100% Cabernet wines. I have some power in the, the Napa wine to blend for consistency or for style. Um, in the case of a vineyard designated wine, you have one choice, you bottle it or you don't. <laughs> Turns out they're great vineyards and there's no excuse in the world for them not to make great wine every year. Uh, but that's that's what Sun Basket and Kronos are. They're single vineyard wines. They are not on the table. Well, the Kronos is not on the table when I blend for the Napa. Okay. Okay. Great. Well. Um, okay. We're going to move on because we've got a few more questions. Um, Ken, going to throw this to you. There's a couple of questions for you as well. Um, one is uh, someone's interested in just the winemaking details. Um, the type of barrels, your your time in barrel, things like that. Um, I, let me just ask, does it vary from vineyard to vineyard, the, the um, elevage of each, or do you try to keep things consistent? Uh, the winemaking does not change from mm -hmm. site to site. When our hope is that we get, through our farming, that we get incredible health and expression of the fruit. And that once received, you know, that we're protecting that expression. Um, we, we want to be completely, we want to be as invisible and transparent as you can be. And I think, and that's, which is much harder than it sounds. Mm -hmm. uh, because we all have some ego and, and we need to learn to kick it to the curb, um, I think, um, as often as you can. But so we try to be supportive always and protective always but never, never forcing anything. Uh, so once received, we wanna protect those inherent qualities that we have, which are stunning um, and not insert ourselves. Um, so the winemaking is, is, I hope, I mean, my goal is to be completely invisible mm -hmm. and 
that's my goal. Uh, and that's harder than it, is, than it sounds. But so the winemaking is similar. We do, you know, our process is one where we bring the fruit in, we, we have sorting line with over a dozen sorters who remove everything unwanted, everything. Um, so that we're going into the fermenters very cleanly. Uh, we do we do a cold soak. We started cold soaking uh, back in the mid '90s using dry ice. And um, actually, Helen Turley, who's, who's an old friend, we were talking back in those days about using doing cold soaking. And um, and, and and Kathy, do you remember uh, Guy Akkad, the guy who was in Burgundy back in the the mid '80s? There was a guy working at I think it was a Domaine Saint Art or whatever, but he was a Lebanese winemaker of all things in Burgundy. And he, he developed this, this cold soaking method for Pinot that was that ended up producing wines that really kind of took the Pinot Noir world by storm. The, the wines were lush, dark, rich, gorgeous wines that were immediately lovely and, 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 and enjoyable. It really, it really turned heads all over the planet. And so this cold soaking really began then for, for me at that time. And so we started doing it with dry ice. So we will spend five days, once, once we've, the fruit is in the fermenter, we will stall the fermentation by using dry ice to bring the temperature down to 40 degrees Fahrenheit. And it just sits and stews. But we're getting, what we're trying to do is to get a, an ac a water-based rendering, an aqueous-based rendering of the tissue without alcohol. Because in the years prior, back in, again, 70s, early 80s, the way that people were trying to get extraction was post-fermentation. They would do a maceration after fermentation, but then you've got alcohol present and the alcohol, it, it, it's, it's so powerful as a solvent that you're not only breaking down the skin tissue, you're breaking down seed tannin. And, and so with Pinot Noir, you would end up with a lot of astringency, a lot of bitterness. And so we, it, it, you would have to correct the wine. You get all this, all this, all of this rendering, but then you'd have to correct the texture. So what Guy Khan came up with was this method of, of doing the soak on the front end before fermentation when there is no alcohol. So you get the rendering this way, there's no alcohol present, so you're not rendering seed tan and you're just getting color, flavor, aroma, and all the things we love about wine. And you're getting a lot of it. It's like so cold we do brew that. coffee. Forgive it's me? Like cold, cold, it's like cold brew coffee. Yeah. Yes, exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. And, mm -hmm. so, and so then, and then we, um, you know, we press quite gently um, and we go to barrel and, uh, we we tend not to rack. Uh, you know, Pinot Noir does not have the tannin structure of of Cabernet that that Kathy has, and uh, so we tend, unless we have a year that has is more um, has more inherent tannin, we will tend not to rack because we don't want to expose the wine, and we'll bottle just prior to next vintage. I it's see. all French oak. It's all French oak, and it's mostly from the Vosges and. We like the sweeter forests, so we like the Vosges and Troncé. A lot of Caduce, maybe, because <laughs> um, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> you know, I can see it behind you. Yeah. <laughs> um, exactly. the, they're all right there. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, well, thank you. That is actually really interesting. And I would one day like to have a longer discussion because when you read about Burgundy, you read about the Guy Akkad era. And um, and there was some also some controversy involved with him as well. Um, oh, yeah. And so I, but not for now. We won't, we'll have to have that discussion later because we have a few more questions and we're running out of time. Um, so quickly, Ken, um, your, uh, someone is interested in the inspiration of the uh, artwork on your labels. Uh, thank you. That's a, the artist is a, a gentleman named David Berkfem. Um, his, his, we, um, Karen and I, my wife and I, our, our original label was very simple, very straightforward, uh, simple text, um, but also forgettable. And uh, <laughs> I mean, we actually walked into a couple of stores in the in the late '90s on the East Coast and couldn't find our wine. Only, only to be told by by the person in the store that oh yeah no your wine's right over there and 
that's not a good situation, you know. <laughs> so we so we decided let's let's have something that um, has a little more drama to it. And so we and we happened to be at a, a gallery, a oh, wine right gallery. You. There it is. Oh, here it is. There you go. Yeah. So Joey Lynn is showing. So this is this is an example of his artwork. This is the original piece for the McCrone Vineyard. This is actually wax. This is carved wax. So he takes he takes a piece of plywood, he routes it out, and then he layers in wax. And so the, the base layer is the ochre, the yellow. And then he does browns, blacks, a little bit of red, and then he then he carves it. He carves the wax, and the depth of his carving determines the color you see. It's the coolest process. Wow. It's the neatest thing. I, so Karen and I saw him at a gallery in the late '90s, and we just fell in love with his work. And we said, "Hey, this is. Would you be willing? Uh, can we commission you to do some pieces for us for our labels?" He was he was all about it, and so that was. That's how that started. Wow, really cool. And uh, I might add that Kathy, you, your uh, your labels also have a very artistic um, vibe to them. Yeah, they're very old life symbols, and it goes back to wine being alive for me. Mm -hmm. And they're seven thousand year old images. the The one across the front is based on rain, and then the one on the capsule is a sprouting seed. And they're both thought to be by archaeologists. Uh, very old life symbols. Oh wow, I didn't know that. That's yeah. cool. Um, okay, uh, is everyone okay if we if we go over a little bit? If we just go because there's a couple of other questions, and um, I think it would be nice. Uh, obviously, if you have to go, then go. But are Ken and Kathy, are you okay with staying a few more minutes? Okay, great. Um, so uh, there's one question that's kind of a doozy that uh, that maybe we'll get to, although we will promise not to go too crazy on it. Um, but so before we get to that, um, uh, someone was interested in the aging recommendations for the wines uh, that that are that are featured tonight. Um, so Kathy, while you're up here, um, can you just tell us a little bit about how you look at that? Yeah, well, these wines are very, very long lived. Um, mm -hmm. I used to say there were 20 or 30 year wines, but now the earliest vintages are sailing right past 30 years. And so I don't mm -hmm. really know how long live they are cellared well. I'm starting to worry about the cork and I'm sure I'll be recorking um, mm -hmm. my library. Uh, that said, the tannins feel like velvet. We're, we're able to lignify the seeds. This is sunny St. Helena. It's the hottest part of the valley. Uh, by the time I pick, the seeds are fully lignified. And so the tannins come from the skins and they feel like velvet. Um, so I think of the wines when they're released and certainly within a year of being released as being in an early fruit driven peak. They're, they've knit, they've settled down and they're very fruity, but they don't, you don't need to wait for phenolics to resolve because they already feel like velvet. If you were to measure the tannin, you get a really big number, but it all feels good. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just fun to watch their life. It's really fun to watch them throughout their life. They remind me of an interesting person. They're interesting in their youth and at the other end, just like people, you know, they go through their terrible twos and their dotage at the other end, but an interesting person is interesting with ups and downs throughout their life. So, and that's how I look at great the aging, well, aging of, of ageable world-class wines. Yeah. That, well, fantastic. Pinot Can, Noir and Cabernet. And yes, Noir. yeah, for sure. And um, and it sounds like, I mean, all of your wines go for a long way, so I don't think it's a, a worry, but even 18, the way you described it, sounds like a vintage that's going to have especially a lot of life force. It's going to be very yeah. long-lived. Yeah. It, and will, then, um, it will likely outlive me. <laughs> no, don't say that. Um, no, okay, no, say that. All right, no. Well, you never know with science, I'm just Kathy. Doing the math. <laughs> Kathy, you could we could have like we could get you frozen in um, carbonite, you know, and thaw you out in the future. Uh, Ken, what about what about the aging profile for the wine tonight and uh, and in general? Not too dissimilar an answer. We uh, in the early part of of our of the life of our wines, you're going to have the fruit is going to be more primary, uh, more direct, youthful, and that's. 
that you as expected. And and there's the beauty of that to me is that that's not me. That has nothing to do with me. That's Mother Nature delivering something really spectacular. And I can, I actually love that. I love tasting youthful Pinot Noir that has the, that primary quality. It just reminds me of how amazing Mother Nature is. And uh, the um, then you begin to see this, you know, that, that, that period of primary fruit for us in our region, it depends on the year and how, um, how much heat, heat we have or don't have, mm -hmm. but uh, how much acidity we have or don't have. But generally, you can say that for the first you know, <laughs> two, two to five years, you're in, that, you're in that mode of a fairly primary wine. Then uh, you start to take on more tea-like qualities, perhaps, you get a lot of complexing, you know, ester formation. You get you get you get a lot of complexing that happens. People can people call it bottle bouquet or what have you. But you do start to get these secondary aromas with time that are really beautiful and complexing and interesting and engaging. And uh, you know you know like like people who are forty years old like Kathy and I, really engaging people <laughs> as we get older. So. I think that, you know, the, and that's a cool thing too. And I can, I, I actually can enjoy wines in all these stages. I think there's something to be gotten from all of that. Right, right. Um, no, great answers. And I, I couldn't agree with uh, both of you more than, um, and especially with your, with your specific wines. Um, okay, here's the last question. And Kathy, it, it sounds like something that would have aligned with the, uh, the slide that you were considering asking about or putting up there, but I let's not do that um, because um, it's, a, it's a topic that could consume hours, but we only have a couple of minutes. And um, this is someone was um, very interested in asking um, how climate change may be impacting your winemaking styles or your vineyards. And so um, obviously it's a, it's a big, big, big topic these days. And I'm sure it's something you guys have talked about a lot and thought about a lot, but um, if you could distill your answers, um, then, uh, then we'll, people can get on to dinner. So uh, Ken, uh, why don't you start and then we'll, we'll let Kathy close it out. Okay. Well, for, for us, um, you know, when, when, I did a lot of uh, a lot of work with temperature summation back when I was writing the the argument for the Yamhill Carlton ABA back in the day. There was a fantastic website that Oregon State has that has daily highs and lows from back since since 1924. Uh, daily highs and lows and rain and precipitation. It's a fantastic site, and I and I spent a lot of time looking at that um, as I was writing the argument, the federal argument. And it was really interesting uh, to see the, how things have changed over, over the years. I would tell you though, that the, to give you an idea of in practice, what's going on. I, I mean, it has been drier. It has been ever so slightly warmer. We, our, our data shows in the last 10 years, we're about a half a degree warmer here where I am. What, half a degree. In practice, when people are coming to this region and they're trying to decide where to plant, if I'm with, if I'm their consultant, we're looking at an area that's between 250 feet of elevation up to 800 or so. Below 250, soils are too deep in our area. We have cold pooling air, which causes frost issues. There's too much water availability. A lot of issues. You get a you get to above 250, you get into ridge lines which drop which which drain well. But then when you get to 800 feet, you begin to encounter cold air from elevation. And it it changes, and so it has been our sweet spot over decades has been essentially this elevation between 250 and 800. There's plenty of land above 800, plenty. No one is planting there yet, no one. And so no one feels, no one's ready to put all that money in a big black hole above 800 feet yet. And mm -hmm. that's when you know, when you know that you have some, you're having a big change in climate is when we will feel comfortable 
comfortable planting higher in elevation. I think it'll happen, mm -hmm. but it hasn't happened yet where no one is feeling good enough about higher temperatures to go that to go higher yet. Okay, well, that's very interesting. And, and thanks for sharing that update from Oregon. Um, Kathy, uh, for our last, uh, our last answer here tonight, what's your, what's your thoughts on this question? Well, here in Napa, climate change is manifesting as erratic more than warming. In the last decade, we've had the very coldest season ever recorded coldest, wettest season, that was 2011. And then we had the very hottest ripening season ever recorded in 2017. So um, canopy management is becoming more and more important. Being nimble is becoming more and more important because if you have a year like 2011, it's very different out in the vineyard than a vintage like 2017. Um, people are being much more careful about um, floppy California straw vines are becoming fashionable again because they protect the, the fruit from sunburn. Um, so canopy management, trellising, um, but so far Cabernet takes a lot of heat to get ripe. In fact, there are a lot of places in the world that have a, a lot of trouble getting Cabernet ripe. So I haven't experienced too much heat, but I have experienced having to be very nimble out there and being reacting to the 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 changes year to year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, and again, the going back to just observation and and it's some of it's new ground and, and you have to trust your instincts. Um, and and I would just probably add that I. I'm sure both of you would agree that the ancillary effects of uh, of climate change, uh, water, and fires, and things like that are are other uh, out of your control, I guess, um, largely. But um, but other things that will that are already impacting your regions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, you both nod. Okay. All right. Well, everyone is probably getting hungry for dinner. So um, I I just want to say uh, thank you, uh, Ken and Kathy. Thanks for asking me to do this. And I, I just absolutely love hearing you both talk about wine and winemaking and your histories. We just scratched the surface tonight, but, um, but it was a really great conversation. So thank you so much. Thank, thank you, Jordan. You yeah. Thank you all. And thanks to everyone else. Have a great, have a great evening. Cheers. Thank you very much. Okay, bye. Take care guys.